Thank you. On behalf of the Semantic Corporation, owner of the Trust Services Business and A10 Networks, I'd like to welcome all of you joining today and thank you for choosing Semantic as your solution provider. My name is Frank Agurdo Machado, Senior Systems Engineer and Trust Services, and we have John Goodmanson from A10's Product Marketing Division presenting as well for today's event. We're happy to speak to you today about optimization of SSL certificate management and the A10 Thunder ADC. With that, we'll go ahead and begin. John and I have many slides to cover today, so let's discuss today's agenda first. We'll be focusing on the current threat landscape, the IC capabilities with the A10, the A10 Thunder and optimization of its perform and its performance. Last, we'll have a question and answer period with respect for time as well. Let's go ahead and get started. And before we move on, actually, look, you're going to see a polling question at the bottom right corner. Go ahead and take a couple minutes to answer that. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on with the presentation while you're answering those questions. Okay? Thanks for doing that. So the threat landscape is ever-changing. We look at this as a double-edged blade. One, our customers have to protect their employees and their customers. Two, we have to stay up with trends to protect our customers as a trust service provider. There are thousands upon thousands of threats and vulnerabilities out there, and this list is constantly growing and has the potential of causing physical and monetary damage to the customer's brand. I prefer to keep this focus to the three architectures of the web, intranet, internet, and extranet. And with that, we'll move on. And you're going to see a lot of numbers and statistics there. We're not really focusing on that at that point. The goal, of course, is that it, the threat landscape is ever-changing. Um, and as, as, a, as network administrators, our job is unfortunately never easy, right? <laughs> never comes handed to us on a dish. So let's talk about trends with SSL certificates. With increasing threats and costs, the need for stronger protection becomes a constant for providers. An example would be Google's initiative to provide higher search ranking for sites with always-on SSL, or what we call AOSSL. The quick answer is AOSSL provides end-to-end -end encryption, or HTTPS connectivity, for the entire user experience. And you may have seen this when you go to Google and you do a search. If you ever get a second, you take a look in the top left corner of, your, of the Chrome of your address bar, and you'll notice that it has an HTTPS symbol once the search starts. And, of course, that is more it's protecting the customer's information as well from any type of interception prior to, or let's say during um, the search module when that's happening. Then move slightly higher up in the sense of the 40,000-foot overview and look at the standards, bodies, and threat protection mechanisms in our community that help propel us forward to guide us as public CAs, browser vendors, web application vendors, or appliance vendors, etc. We have the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, recommendations for migration to SHA-2. We then take this guidance and move it, on, move it into how it will interoperate in the real world, and this is done by a conglomerate of browser vendors and public CAs. We call this the CA browser form, or you may hear it as CABF. During the duration of this presentation, you'll hear us using CABF interchangeably, or you, hear, you may hear CA browser form. Again, synonymous terminology. As part of the CABF, we are, there are, there's an established baseline requirements, or BRs, that are applied to the industry on how public trusted SSL certificates should be operating in the Internet community. Think of this as a uniform set of rules, or a minimum, we should be utilizing as a PKI provider and how browsers will operate and what they will trust when it comes to certificates. Remember, this applies to the public trusted side of the world. Some do the minimum, others above and beyond the services, hence the cost difference between PKI providers. And of course, in this industry, PKI is pay, you pay what you get for. Okay? And last, we look at innovations like Perfect Forward Secrecy, or PFS, the quick explanation is the constant ratcheting or of session or symmetric encryption keys to ensure if a, pair, if a key pair is compromised in an SSL session, the interceptor may be able to go back maybe one message, maybe two if you're lucky, but really nothing more than that. Again, the key word is that constant ratcheting of the symmetric encryption key or the session key. Again, functionality with the current technology to better serve and protect our customers. Go and take another second, look at that slide, and we'll move on. And as a reminder, before I go into the slide, if you haven't answered the polling questions or for those who have come in late, there's a polling question at the bottom right corner. If you could take a minute to answer that, we'd appreciate it. So speaking of PFS, let's do some quick coverage. The random generation, exchange, and discarding of keys to create constant meta protection of the SSL session. This can include ECC, or elliptic curve cryptography, with Diffie-Hellman, 
Remember, with any cipher usage model, though, weak ciphers can still exist and require administrators to be cognizant of their usage. So again, it really doesn't matter where you're getting your key pair from or what what line of technology, RSA or DSA or DHE, what have you. Um, the bottom line is that you always want to be cognizant of the cipher keys that are being allowed to use by web applications. And last, we'll look at the benefits. Past messaging is protected. And ECC provides performance improvement. And again, we're going to cover that a little deeper as we move along through the presentation. Okay, let's move on. The unfortunate reality is stronger security and protection leads to complexity and certificate management challenges. We run into things like certificate expiration, internal policies that can assist or limit abilities to take advantage of earlier renewal points. And again, those are vantage points, right? Maybe not necessarily technical, but definitely it applies to the business. It applies, and that there's always that physical and logical aspect of that model that can get affected monetarily. An example would be semantics policy on 90, 60, 30-day renewals. Some customers simply cannot use anything above 30 per their own infosec. And again, I'm not saying that it's good, bad, or indifferent. It's things that, that customers should be aware of. And that kind of leads us into the next point, which is it's a hur it is a hurdle but we do our best to ensure customers are informed. And a lot of times for customers who have spoken to me before, even in this web seminar, who've had separate pre-qualification calls with myself, I always make an effort to talk about the renewal policy, kind of that best bang for the buck and kind of the synonymous uh, relationship between the, the, not just the synonymous terminology, but the relationship between the two and how it matters. Okay? And how it matters technically to the customer as well or to the engineer who has to do all that work to get those renewals in place. Okay? And again, in some cases, they can adjust or request adjustments to get the best bang for the buck in that model. And again, it's all about the information. It's about the delivery of the information to ensure the customer is aware of it, and it's that ongoing education in that aspect. So moving down, we see deployment, tracking, and other auditing requirements that can add to the problem if your certificate lifecycle management, or what we call a CLM, is lacking. And again, that's not necessarily applying to self-sign. We can look at even in, uh, we can even look at the public CAs. That sometimes management interfaces are what they should be. And I, I, I quote Fran Roche within our organization who always said, not all CAs are created equal, which is absolutely right in our industry. Um, some have more than others. Some do things a little differently. And again, it's not good, bad, or indifferent. It always goes back to that, you will get what you pay for in this industry. Okay. And again, we talk about compliance. Right? Compliance can be another hurdle as the threat landscape is constantly changing. And again, we've kind of, I've talked about that a few times already. You'll probably hear this kind of beat it to death a little bit in this presentation. And again, you can't really tell, push that point home enough about the threat landscape constantly changing. And a lot of the, some of that has to do with changes in computing power and other, and other adaptations in the network technology that adapt and, and adjust to the industry. But again, it's that threat landscape's ever changing, right? very dynamic in that aspect. And this also includes security vulnerabilities that can create immediate havoc to an administration or a PKI team. Um, an example of that would be Heartbleed or the Poodles that have been out lately in regards to OpenSSL and their libraries. Again, many challenges for administrators. But I'd like to keep that focus on the three basic terrains of communication that can be affected from an SSL perspective, intranet, internet, and extranet. Right. And as for any, again, for any of those customers who have spoken to me before about this, I always kind of keep the focus in those three areas. Because that's, I mean, although you can apply SSL certificates kind of every, everywhere within the metaphoric household, um, again, those are kind of the three basic areas you'll really find its usage or most heavily used. Okay? So go ahead and take another second, look at the slide, and then we'll go ahead and move on. And again, if you're seeing the polling question at the bottom right and you haven't answered, um, your participation would be greatly appreciated. All right, let's move on. So certificate expirations and tracking, kind of cover that a little bit in there at a 40,000 foot overview. But again, it's a very critical aspect of certificate management. And it ensures that your certificates stay on or uptime, right? That's a lot. You'll hear that a lot from even from a post-sales perspective when dealing with technical support from a semantic perspective, um, but always about that uptime, about ensuring we, we keep a good eye on those certificates. There's always good ownership, et cetera or valid ownership, meaning people are still with the company, with the teams, things like that. When certificates expire, systems fail, right? If you're running on the online service, the service may even terminate. So definitely things to absolutely be concerned with. In other cases, policies can dictate an error message, thus stopping connectivity. Regardless, your users would be affected, and your business continuity is disrupted, right? So this can disrupt loyalty in your brand or to your customer usage, or, or even customers going to your competitors instead. Again, it applies, and that's general, right, 40,000-foot overview, um, whether you're e-commerce or 
tech industry, what have you. So let's kind of do a quick recap of the recent SHA-1 deprecation plan by major browsers and public CAs. Um, started up at the NIST, trickled down to the CAD form, and then of course it kind of is you know relayed or, or trickled down into the reality of what we do in the trenches, not only as, as service providers, but as customers that use our products as well. This is a requirement for organizations to have a plan in place to migrate from SHA-1 to SHA-2 enabled SSL certificates. As you can see in this slide, this is already taking place as time goes. It will not be just extended validation or EV certificates that are going to be affected. Maybe in the short term it will be, but in the longer term it's going to affect kind of everything SSL. And the big hitters are adopting this and it will only trickle down to other vendors as they prepare for the SHA-2 adoption model. So again, we're looking at um, 2014, Chrome 39, 4041, which is already coming out. You're already starting to see this happen. Um, and of course, now we're in 2015, Firefox is going to start showing differences or, or different results in the browser. Again, doesn't mean the website's necessarily going to give you an error right now, but at some point, it'll start letting you know that it, it definitely you should be concerned as either an end user or a person using that browser seeing that site. Again, go ahead and take a second, look at the slide, uh, look at the timeline, and then we'll go ahead and move on. So let's look at how to mitigate certificate management challenges, right, or management problems, we can say, I guess, in some cases. Um, first, we want to simplify deployment. One methodology is to utilize load balancers, or what I like to call SSL concentrators, kind of a nice general term. They can be critical in helping to optimize performance. This John Goodmanson from A10 Networks will present on how A10 can help optimize that performance. For those who are not familiar, SSL certificates can terminate at the load balancer vice the individual servers or nodes, thus creating efficiency in the overall model from point to point. Remember, if the system has to be PCI compliant, each communication point in the SSL session must have it as well. Right. Again, that's kind of, I don't want, I'll digress from that because that's not the focus of this presentation, but just kind of some additional tidbits to be aware of. Whether you are deploying SSL certificates on a load balancer or a server, automated installations can help eliminate potential manual errors and make sure the SSL certificate is installed correctly the first time. And to add on to that, you always, if you're, when you're using automated installs from, a, a, let's say, a PCI vendor, like in some cases we'll talk about here, um, you always ensure that you have the most up-to-date root hierarchy, whether that, and that's, of course, that intermediate CA. As anyone who's dealt with SSL certificates knows that intermediate CA is not handed out to the clients. Even though the client may collect it, it's something that the public CA, it's their job to ensure you always have the latest and greatest, meaning stay up with it, staying up with industry standard. Okay? And again, um, having better security on the key length can help with performance. Um, and I'll expand on ECC in the next slide, and I don't, again, don't want to go in too far into this slide as well. And the visibility and tracking of actions and certificates help with compliance and audit. Also, the alerting and notifications are especially helpful that take the ease, that take the ease of either creating or constantly manipulating due to change of ownership, etc. Right. Again, kind of goes back to that CLM, right? The certificate lifecycle management model. Um, you want to make sure that that whatever you're using, you have some of those things already in place. And again, it's not always the. Is it easy to get a PKI off the ground? Absolutely. But it's that care and feeding. It's that that constant management. That's really where the rubber meets the road. That's where the costs start showing up on paper. Because um, I've heard a lot of people tell me, or a lot of customers say to me that, you know, well, I can just issue my own certificates for free, and that's really not the case when you look at it now. The reality of anything in an enterprise network is not necessarily it's not going to be free. There's going to be some level of um, paying into something to get it going, or even from an internal PKI perspective, building onto that cryptography or up cryptographic updates. Those be very expensive. Okay. Again, kind of last year with compliance, a mixed certificate environment can complicate things, especially where instances of self-signed certificates are deployed. At this juncture, an enterprise-wide discovery tool or holistic discovery tool. It's highly recommended to scan portions or the entire network to ensure inventories of SSL certificates are accurate, and they're kept accurate is the key. The assist, is, the, the assist in the setting of holistic alerts and notifications. Again, kind of that, that ensuring that, you know, if I, I guess the unexpected expirations is one way to look at it, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but the unexpected expirations is a nice thing to be cognizant of because, okay, great, I have notifications going out, but it's that when somebody leaves the company unexpectedly. Um, you 
want to be aware of that. Okay, look, I'm sending stuff out, and, and these people aren't getting it anymore. So you can take corrective action. And of course, of course, with the various recommendations and evolving industry standards and company policies, organizations are tasked with ensuring that their key lengths, algorithms, and expirations are installed correctly and in compliance. Again, kind of a lot of stuff up there, right? Kind of throwing a lot of stuff above your heads, but it, there's there's ways of bringing it all together, create kind of that funneling effect, right? So that way, I'm not just kind of you know, mad dashing to grab information, ensuring that I'm doing it correctly, um, thus creating that stress and trickling it down to the teams. And again, let's jump to the next slide and we'll talk more about that. So in this slide, let's have a quick discussion on the lift the curve cryptography or ECC. With the use of ECC certificates, we know some things, right? Servers can handle more requests faster while using fewer CPU resources for page run times. Okay. ECC is initially optimized for desktop and laptop users where the majority of e-commerce takes place. Again, can that be adapted to other environments? Absolutely, it's a certificate. But again, that's kind of was the main focus in the beginning. And ECC, of course, is not anything that's been out for a year or so, maybe in the sense of mainstream usage, but it's been out there for quite some time. Even prior to the semantic acquisition, as VeriSign, we were, we were doing specialized functionality with ECC certificates, too. Okay. But in this case, we use the, the ECC 256 curve. This is considered 10,000 times more secure than your traditional RSA 2048-bit key length. Okay. And of course, we expect mobile devices to ultimately benefit the most with ECC. Because of the lack of CPU and power consumption, your, your, your end, the, the best give back is to the end user who is either using the application or even a mobile browser to connect to those sites and the run times can be faster in some cases, but from a load-bearing perspective, you're not, the, the, the mobile user isn't waiting while they're in transit, again, changing network to network if they're going Wi-Fi to cellular, et cetera. Okay? And again, thus sucking up battery power, right, is kind of the, the end-all, be-all. And as an industry leader, we have, we've had our ECC routes in place since about 2007. So this means ECC, from a semantic perspective, will have a much better ease of use due to our root ubiquity and legacy and next-gen device restores. Right? So again, it's always, about, it's always about having those CAs out there parked ahead of time. And again, is that easy for any public CA to probably do? Probably. They, they can think that far ahead and start putting their stuff out there. But it's really the relationships you build with the other vendors, with the Microsofts, the Googles, the Apples, to ensure that that there's going to be that ubiquity, right? Because just passing it out isn't really how it works. There's, there are CA programs that require certain public CAs to meet a specific requirement, so they can't have their CAs immediately pushed out and things like that as well. So again, that root ubiquity, that's where really the rubber meets the road, right? Because those clients have to carry those roots. The clients have to trust, and those clients are one to many, right? And that root, I should say, is one to many, and many to many clients out there. And as a recent focus group of customers told us, they believe Semantic is the only CA that can build in new infrastructures. And again, what do you think that goes back to? It goes back to that CA ubiquity in the environment, right? And again, let's go ahead and keep moving on. So pushing forward at this juncture, let's start our transition into the Certificate Intelligence Center and how, take, how A10 can participate in the automation of those certificate tasks. First, let's look at some CIC basics. CIC is a three-phase approach. We have two modules available today. We have the discovery and business continuity, and then we have that automation of the SSL renewal tasks. But the thing you have to remember about automation is it's based on discovered certificates or certificates from the captured inventory. And I think I don't want to use captured as a pejorative. Captured is a very positive term here. From an administrative perspective, I'm seeing it's that I don't know what I know until I know everything. And when I see that inventory, now I'm kind of metaphorically knowing everything because not only is it the discovery aspect but it's the business continuity it's the it's the continuously telling you of those changes that are happening to certificates um, hey the certificate was here today oh by the way it just showed up in five other places you know a week later or two days later when I ran that scan but again you're aware of that propagation model so when there is a renewal phase and someone does automation to let's say one a10 box if there's not a mirroring or pushing of the key pair from the, the appliance itself, then maybe I can go do it. Maybe I know or I can alert the team that, hey, I'm, I'm in a better position to tell you now that, hey, you need to also put it in about four or five other places. Maybe it's not just sitting in appliance. Maybe it's on other network, other segments within the network that I have to be concerned with as well. And that may or may not fall in my jurisdiction. Okay. So again, two of the three phases, quick summary, discovery, business continuity, automation is available today, and then risk assessment we'll see later on in 2015. 
with that, let's go ahead and move on. So through CIC automation, certificate renewal tasks can be utilized with agent or agentless models based on the type of node. This can be done with basic server nodes using IIS or Apache. An agentless model, agentless models, excuse me, for load balancers as well. An agentless using the existing sensor that are managing your current network scans. The key on this slide is to understand that certificates are not issued from the SSL account will be transferred accordingly. And if you look at some of these boxes in here, some of them will say set up, which means that, okay, I'm already pulling from your account. Well, others are saying transfer means that, look, it doesn't necessarily belong. There might be a semantic cert, but it doesn't necessarily, be, it's not from your account. So if you are going to automate it, you're going to transfer it over to your account. Does that mean you have to do that with all your certificates? Absolutely not. And that's what CIC is about those options, creating, but putting you in a better place to make those decisions about those options. Do I want to transfer it? Now that I know where everything is in the toy box, do I kind of want to just leave everything out there? Or do I want to create a cons consolidation phase? The nice thing is I'm already a couple steps ahead of the game. So if our management says, hey, we need to consolidate to one or two CAs, I already have a means to do it. Okay. So let's look at interoperability with other elements in the network. SSL certificates can be deployed to many different areas of the enterprise fabric. ADCs, routers, etc. Right, the list is long but distinctive. The management of SSL certificates on the ADCs, as an example, can be aligned with the device. CIC has been tested and validated against leading network and security appliance vendors thus far, and the list is growing. So again, some things to be aware of that that as a, as a solution, and CIC is very heavily customer driven. Like managed PKI for SSL, that can be that can be. It's an anchored solution. It's been out there for a very long time. 15 plus years we've been doing PKI, and we've just been kind of building on it and making it better, et cetera, um, better, faster, all those great things. Um, so the trends can tell us how to do our functionality. And of course, we always take customer feedback. The CIC is, is the antithesis of that model. CIC says, hey, I, I've driven off that customer feedback. I run it through the, the advisory panel who says, you know, kind of the yays and nays on, on what kind of adaptations we're going to do to it. But at the same time, Again, with that coupled with that, that external customer feedback of the users of the service, that can also help us build it into the next steps of the solution. Right. Let's go ahead and move on. So let's talk about the discovery and the risk assessment. And before I wrap up here in a little bit, I'd like to bring emphasis to the CIC risk assessment, or what they used to call it. You may see it as security rating, but we like to more formalize it as risk assessment. Um, and it's for all your SSL certificates in your inventory. Again, regardless of the CAs that are out there or whatever we discover, we can provide a risk assessment. It will also report of potential vulnerabilities such as Poodle version 3 or Heartbleed based on the effective version of OpenSSL, once again, uh, or those, those OpenSSL targets that are sitting out in your network. And again, I don't want to use target as a pejorative term, but as a sense of that for things that CIC is seeing for you, making available so you can start understanding what needs to be, what steps need to be taken. The goal of this rating is to provide a, as much insight to the administrators as possible from the discovery process to help them stay in compliance and approve the overall SSL security implementation across the enterprise. This portion comes lock, stock, and barrel with discovery. So it's not, while there is a risk assessment service we have attached to this that will be out eventually, what you're looking at here today comes lock, stock, and barrel with the solution. These are things that we provide to you, again, based on every certificate that's discovered. Okay. And with that, let's go ahead and move on. So at this juncture, let's look at the interoperability with A10. Since we work together, we future-proof CIC's discovery and automation processes to take care of new versions, etc. Automated installations to manage CSR or key pair generation, uh, meaning that we don't key pair recycle, or we adapt from discovery to renewal and automation. Again, steps that you can either grow into or you can do it all at once or what have you. We have solutions that allow you to take advantage of all those. That, again, from the longer term, from a better cost perspective, it gets that best, bang, that best bang for the buck. At this point, I'd like to transition to John from A10 to give the advantages and a deeper explanation about their products. OK. All right. Thank you, Frank. Um, as we have seen, certificate management is a critical component in AD, AD Data Center. It is important to ensure proven interoperability with the various networking elements that compose these infrastructures. One of the most critical components within such networks has historically been known as an advanced load balancer. Today, the modern incarnations of these solutions 
are defined as application delivery controllers or ADCs. These ADCs provide numerous benefits in one scalable and high capacity appliance. The value of these solutions can be broadly categorized into three areas. The first is server availability. It is of course imperative that applications, web and database servers be constantly online. If customers, off-site employees, remote design centers, and partners fail to reach your site, you lose business and your productivity suffers. ADCs ensure that servers, regardless of location, are available 24-7 to 365. Purpose-built hardware reaching well over 100 gigabits per second of layer 7 traffic per appliance and high-capacity virtual ADCs supporting over 5 gigabits per second per instance provided, provide the needed scalability for any environment. By clustering multiple <coughs> units together, over 1 terabits per second of the same traffic is supported. Another key value of ADCs is the ability to cut your server farm needs by more than 50%. The second so-called pillar of ADCs involves enhancing the speed with which requested content is delivered to the client. This allows LAN-like responses to sessions spanning the globe. Applications, even those legacy versions with a lot of underlying so-called chatty protocols, become dramatically more responsive. The third principal value involves security. Some ADCs integrate a web application firewall to afford protection that in IPSs, next-gen firewalls, and other solutions, security solutions simply can't provide. Only web app firewalls guard against attacks targeting the applications themselves. Such app firewalls help you pass security audits and protect your applications. What is great about ADCs is that all this value and more is combined into one compact one to two rack unit appliance. This consolidates numerous point products into a single solution for much lower cost and simplified installation and configuration. The ADCs generally are placed near your web application and database servers deep in the network. They are fully compatible with all communication protocols, routers, switches, and firewalls. Basically everything within the data center. Usually they are deployed in HA pairs or in clusters with active-active or active standby mode. The ADC provides numerous intelligent traffic management capabilities such as Layer 4 load balancing. Layer 7 content switching gives the ability to peer into the, pack, into the packet payload to optimally balance incoming requests to the various servers present. Surge protection and other methods further balance traffic rates. By making the server farm more efficient, servers can be reduced by 50%. Clients may be able to receive special treatment such that their prioritized requests can be quickly routed to the server that handles the specific services. This allows IT to eliminate duplicated, duplicated servers that handle these applications and services. Application response times are dramatically improved. Through local in-memory caching, content can be served up immediately without going to the server, and methods are provided to ensure this data is fresh. Data compression via the industry standard GZIP algorithm can also make the communication system more efficient and ultimately deliver content to users faster by reducing actual transmitted information. Such a reduction also lowers WAN bandwidth needs and therefore cost. WAN protocol optimization methods that are fully RFC standardized, such as selective acknowledgement, client keep alive, fast ramp, and many others further improve transmission efficiencies. Integrated web application firewalls protect applications from day zero attacks, such as cross-site request forgery, SQL injection, cookie poisoning, and dozens of others in real time, automatically, with no IT administration manual intervention. ADCs with hardware-based SSL processing can further can, can provide high levels of bulk SSL throughput and SSL transaction processing. DDoS and protocol anomaly protection can be provided in hardware as well to, prevent, to protect financial and other institutions from having your servers taken down. In order to be practical, 
ADCs need to be easy to install and configure. Now, one should look for solutions that offer a choice of how to set up the proper policies. Some users will gravitate towards a fully automated GUI with drop-down menus, smart templates, wizards, to automate and speed deployment. Some, especially with a Cisco upbringing, will prefer a Cisco-like CLI and even convert from a legacy end-of-sale pace appliance. Still more want an explicit API that allows fine-grained policy creation. In order to provide all of the stated capabilities, an ADC must be able to handle SSL encrypted traffic. This allows traffic to be examined in clear text within the ADC and then redirected to servers. Traffic can also be temporarily forwarded to other elements, such as an IPS or Layer 7 aware firewall for further security checks before being returned to the ADC for re-encryption. SSL processing is quite intensive and is thus not managed by the servers. This saves on extremely expensive SSL cards for servers, but with A10, for instance, offers high capacity processing in the tens of gigabits per second and hundreds of thousands of SSL transactions per second without a 2K or 4K bit certificates. A10 supports all the major cryptographic techniques. To manage this, the ADC has these digital certs directly loaded on the appliance. In turn, such certs must be discoverable by certificate intelligence solutions. As you heard from Frank's discussion, perfect forward secrecy is a new and powerful form of security. PFS makes it essentially impossible for hackers to decrypt information. And even if they can somehow break into one session, each session must be independently broken. Keys are constantly changed to prevent security breaches. Now, while PFS improves security, a lot of data center elements, such as servers and application delivery solutions, are not designed to optimize performance when key lengths reach 1,000 bits and even longer. A10 specifically supports up to four, <laughs> four quad-core SSL security processors and have added special kernel-level driver enhancements to provide industry-leading performance. You also heard Frank mention elliptic curve algorithms and their advantages. Such methods provide higher level security than traditional methods that actually demand longer key lengths of 2,000 to 4,000 bits. With elliptic curve and Diffie-Hellman, processing levels can still be taxing the servers and other data center components. A10 fully supports these newer security methods and provides the most optimized cryptographic processing available. Today, certificate intelligence systems often need to be manually configured to discover the various certificates in the network. This involves the importing and exporting of certs, renewal, backup, and other administrative tasks. Whether the element is a network firewall, intrusion prevention system, AppAware next-gen firewall, IDS, servers, and so on, the process can be tedious, time-consuming, error-prone, and potentially allow expired certs to be present. IT can also overlook some certs as well. ADCs with an appropriate API, application programming interface, allow the auto-discovery of all the cert certificates on this appliance. ADCs that support SSL processing will need, of course, the digital certificates, along with a wide array of supporting in encryption algorithms and the ability to handle key lengths up to 4,096 4 bit keys today and potentially more in the future. To simplify certificate management, consolidate the number of certs in the network, and ease the discovery process, the digital certificates may be placed directly on the ADC. The thousands of certs installed on the various servers can actually then be moved to the A10 Thunder Series ADC. A10 offers our AX API, an application programming interface, to ease the certificate discovery process. A10 has been fully tested and validated with Symantec's Certificate Intelligence Center. Now, not only is this discovery task managed without IT manual intervention, but all the other principal attributes of certificate management are taken care of. For instance, 
CIC dynamically monitors all certs throughout the network, including those installed on the ADC. The certificate renewal process needed to validate authenticity is fully automated. CIC provides the intelligence to do scheduled backups from the network and provide notification if certs are expired and certs on the E10 appliance are fully supported. If the cert is found to be expired, then CIC has the capability to automatically contact the certificate authority and obtain an update. Now, not only from Symantec, Norton, Norton Secured, but also from all the other CA providers. One of the advanced benefits of modern ADC, such as the A10 Thunder Series, is the ability to segment the appliance into multiple partitions. These partitions can be fully independent, as with Thunder HVA designs, or effectively independent with the use of application delivery partitions, or ADPs. This, in effect, divides one appliance into dozens or even hundreds of individual virtual appliances. With this multi-tenant environment, IT admins can define a unique set of policies for each application, or service, or even type of client, such as a mobile, cloud, or e-commerce application. Having the power to create over 1,000 ADPs with each instance tailored to particular needs is very valuable. However, if it affects the certificate management process, it could be pro problematic. So working with Symantec, A10 has also validated the same methodology as previously mentioned with this high-density multi-tenant scenario. Symantec CSC automatically monitors the certs on each instance independent of each other. The same goes for certificate renewals and also for backing up certs on one CIC. Legacy networks are forced to have numerous servers with each one required to have a digital certificate. This forces a great deal of manual intervention monitoring, and renewal. With the latest generation of ADCs, enterprises of all sizes, cloud services, and web hosters, and many others, can substantially reduce the server sprawl present that, you, that you, you'll wind up having in a lot of data centers today. You can also consolidate the number of ADCs through high-capacity multi-tenant appliances. And by working in tandem, with certificate management solutions, such as Symantec CIC, substantially cut the number of needed certificates by bringing, the, by bringing those certs onto the, AD, uh, on the ADC appliance. Working together, A10 Thunder Series application delivery controllers and Symantec CIC, along with many other infrastructure vendors, provide a fully interoperable ecosystem. A10 helps simplify the deployment of Symantec CIC certificate management solution, and maximizes overall SSL performance. This in addition to all the other benefits advanced ADCs provide. I will now turn it back over to Frank, who can provide a summary, and then we can take your questions. Frank? Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Good information as well. Um, before we move on, though, I, I looking over my shoulder at the clock to make sure on time constraints, totally miss it. We have another polling question out there. It's been out there for quite some time, so I apologize for that. But if you could take a second, talk about the validation or the validation of interoperability between certificate intelligence solutions and networking devices. Um, if you could take a second again, if you haven't seen that, or for latecomers, if you haven't seen that polling question, if you could answer that, I'd appreciate it. And again, we're going to move into the, the summary, and then we're going to talk about um, the Q question answering period and, and go from there for the rest of the duration of the web seminar. Again, that was great stuff, John. Thanks for passing that on. Um, but at this point, let's do kind of a quick summary about what we learned so far, because we have covered a lot of information in a short amount of time. First of all, we automate, save time, and reduce manual errors. And again, I say we as, as a collective, us and A10 working together through the CIC solution. Maintain control with centrally managed renewals across servers and load balancers. Again, this is where the A10 Thunder comes into play of, of the automation, um, again, to an ADC. And again, again, enable easy adoption on A10 ADCs. Um, the automation process is working through the AX APIs. And of course, 
staying in compliance and adhering to best, adhering to best practices. We talked about that earlier in some of the, the traditional semantic slides we talked about, just kind of the, the, the you know, the tribes and tribulances or, or of what an administrator has to go through on a regular basis. Um, unfortunately, it's not, these aren't things that always are handed to us on a dish and we have to kind of guess and figure out and sometimes kind of go directly to the vendors to, to find out that industry standards are coming down. Um, the SHA-2 scenario is, a very, is, is very prevalent in that aspect, right? Um, the, the higher governing authorities are saying one thing, the CAs are like, well, you can't really apply to the industry that fast, and everybody at some point comes together, and voila, you have <laughs> the SHA-256 changes that are coming out. So, so again, it's kind of that, that constantly staying in compliance, and sometimes it's a battle, sometimes it's not a race we're always running in first place, but again, we have to constantly do it for the best practices. And again, that practice is protection, not only for us, for our customers, but for yourself as our customer of your customers, of your, your employees, your environment and ecosystem. And lower the security risk through risk assessment and visibility. Again, every certificate that's found, regardless of where it resides in your ecosystem or your network fabric, um, the IC goes the extra step to say, look, not only am I gonna populate 15, 20, or 30 points of data for you, I'm gonna also tell you how it rates up against best security practices or best PKI practices in the industry, even if it's a self sign. So that way at least you have a good understanding of where it stands. And do I need to do anything to that? Because sometimes that doesn't mean I need to go and spend money. I metaphorically as a, as a network administrator, it means that maybe, hey, maybe I need to go tell that network team or the, the server team who owns those nodes that, hey, maybe start closing off weak ciphers. Do we really need to have them out there? If we're doing server-to-server -server environments, what kind of data is being passed? Is it money? Is it monetary? Should we be only using strong ciphers? And if we're not, how come? It's server-to-server, -server, right? Why is there cipher negotiation? Things like that, right? Little little nuances in that model that requires to, unfortunately, kind of wear a lot of caps, and sometimes it's left to us to alert those teams to make them aware of it. Okay. So before we move into Q&A, let's talk about kind of some next steps. You can get more information um, on the CIC at the semantic link, and then we also provide the A10 link as well. A lot of information there. Um, and of course, the um, semantic CIC and A10 network uh, brief you can see on the resources at the A10 network site as well. And if you are looking to see a CIC demo, if you haven't seen it yet, you can contact your sales, your sales rep directly, or your, what we call your account manager, or you can use the SSL Enterprise Sales alias there at the bottom. At any time, you can call Semantic Sales at the 866 number, and you can call the A10 Network Sales Reps at the 88 number below as well. Okay. And with that, we should have time for one more polling question. Um, this time, I will be on top of it without having to look over my shoulder at time. And if you could take a second, this is a quick one. Um, let us know how useful we are, and we can go from there again. Take a couple minutes to do that, and we're going to go ahead and move into your Q&A. So John, you and I can kind of ping pong this and go back and forth with it. Um, I'll go ahead and start first and take a look and see if we have any questions out there. Um, give me one second. So I've got quite a pretty large list here, so give me just one second. Let me take a look. So right off the bat, let's take a look at this one. So let me, let me throw one out here, and then John, I'll let you go and take a look at them. We'll kind of go back and forth here. Um, Here's a question. So in CIC, will I be able to get reports on the certificates that are installed on the A10 ADC? And the, the quick answer is absolutely yes. In CIC, we have summary and detailed reports. Um, they go pretty deep. We capture about 14 major areas. If I have to kind of create a, you know, a kind of a, a, a transition, translation over into how our, our, um, our executive dashboard reporting works, um, you, there's about 14 different areas of data that we capture in those 14 areas. There's a lot of information we give. But again, at a high level, summary and detail would be a nice way to look at it. Um, and you can also get custom reports as well. And again, you can kind of build them out. We create two basic formats, soft and hard copy, soft being Excel and hard being PDF. Um, and you can pick and choose the criteria, criteria you'd like to see in there. And again, it's very easy to do. Um, you can set frequencies on it. And CIC kind of always moves in a, in a kind of a roving reporting mode, but re reporting, reporting mode, if I can get that right. But left to right is kind of the way it operates, right being the end result. Um, and again, I can set things up in there and just let them run. And that's even for reporting, I can set up frequencies. Okay. John, you want to go ahead and take a stab at one of those? Okay, yeah, I've got a few questions here. Thanks, Frank. Um, one question we have is basically what version of CIC does this integration support? 
Uh, basically, the answer is CIC 2.0 or later. Uh, another question here is what browser uh, what browser support PFS? And pretty much basically all the major ones, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Internet Explorer, but they have to support TLS 1.0. Uh, third kind of quick question here, what version of uh, A10 uh, operating system, which is otherwise known as ACOS, does ECDCE support? And basically, uh, for, that, for those users of actual A10, uh, the, the code base is 2.7.2 uh, P3, as well as uh, our upcoming 4.0. Um, I guess I'll turn it over to Frank for, for, for some questions yep. there, and then I've got some more after that. Sure. Thanks, John. Uh, so here's one right here. Is why is SHA-1 being dep depreciated, or we'll say deprecated, if it hasn't been broken? That's a great question. Um, you don't want to wait. <laughs> Shaw, the Shaw suite in general, right, if you look at the Shaw suite in general, it kind of suffers from the same set of potential vulnerabilities out there. Some are not necessarily economically feasible, but remember, economically feasible usually means that I don't have enough computing power. So again, computing power is moving very fast. Um, are we saying that the Shaw changes and pcaches are, are completely based on just the speed of a processor? Not necessarily, but it is a helper. So the reality is you have higher governing bodies that look at this and say, look, and they, and then those governing bodies, they have also advisory panels. The, and again, I'm not putting names out there to get anybody in trouble, but you know, you got your AT&Ts, your Verizon business, you got your really big, large, I guess almost you could say telco slash kind of cloud vendors that have been out there for a really long time that, that do participate, uh, ourselves, inclu ourselves included as semantic, that participate and said, does that make sense for us to start moving the industry this way? The reason the cap F was created when you get away from the extended validation side of it is saying, look, okay, you're creating all this great stuff and you want to move and you've got this, this plan for the next 10, 15 years of computing power and PKI, et cetera, but now let's bring it to reality of what the customer has to deal with on a daily basis and, if, how, and the time limit that we can put in there. And so the cabinet plays a really big part in that to buffer that to the industry. So it kind of got away from your question, but the answer is it isn't broken, um, but it's not a matter of, of if, it's a matter of when. Just like with key sizes, 1024 was never broken, 768 was, 1024 never was. But it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when that happens. We're already ahead of the game. and that's. And that's a great thing that CabF has done is it's put a lot of the browser and PCA vendors on the same page, uh, and in some cases with the customer. So as we move forward, it's not this reactive move forward, we're proactively moving forward, but we're doing it with a sunsetting methodology so the customers aren't being left behind. And again, we're only going to be as strong as our weakest customer out there that has to make those changes, and that's why we work really hard in these areas to make sure that we can move the customer up accordingly. Sometimes it's baby steps. So I hope that answers it. A little bit overly long-winded, but... Let me take a shot at one more here, and I'll kind of give the ball back to John. Um, here's a good one: is how can we tell the browser on our mobile phone, um, you know, albeit an iPhone or an Android, is SHA one or SHA two? Well, you can connect the size; that's one way of doing it. But the, I, mean, I guess it's not always a surefire way. But at the end of the day, you probably want to contact your vendor um, if you're talking about corporate issue phones, or if it's your own phone, your BYOD into your corporate network or what have you. At the end of the day, you probably want to either talk to probably the vendor directly, um, and not the vendor of the phone per se, unless it's Google or something, but maybe um, the vendor of the operating system or the browser itself, so if it's Safari and things like that. A lot of times they have a really great blog. You can go in there and you can find that information fairly quickly. Um, but a lot of the, the newer browsers are adapting pretty fast to it, so again, just kind of some food for thought there. John, I'll go ahead and let you take a stab at a couple of you here. we got a few more minutes, so I'll go ahead and take a stab at a couple of them. Okay, thanks, Frank. Uh, one question I got was, does A10 support SHA2? Uh, of course, something that, meant that uh, Frank talked about. And the answer is, of course, uh, we do support um, all the latest ciphers, hashing algorithms, and uh, methods of authentication, so including definitely SHA2. Uh, another question here is um, the heart bleed vulnerability. And basically, how does A10 prevent this? Uh, basically, you know, we're not, A10 ADCs are not vulnerable to heart bleed. Uh, actually, only those type of solutions that have used basically an open SSL have that issue. And uh, so A10 does not have that. We're, we're fully covered there. There's actually some blogs on our, on our website. I went back all the way to back in April when this was uh, a major issue out there in the market. So 
definitely feel free to check our blog back in that, that time frame for more details on it. Um, another question here is, is there a license cost with the CIC and A10 integration? The answer is no. Uh, and with all of uh, A10 uh, features and capabilities, everything's all in a one all-inclusive license. So A10 doesn't ding customers if you want different kinds of uh, various features and things, caching, compression, and the like, it's all included for, for uh, one cost. So uh, no, no cost there. And I think, well, let me go ahead and pass it back to, uh, to Frank. Okay, thanks, John. So, okay, so another one here I see is, uh, and we got a few more minutes. So, um, the SHA-1 deprecation plan by major browsers, um, is it also applicable to internal CA issued certificates? Quick answer would be probably not. Um, I'll, I'd like to give you the definitive no, but again, as long as you're not cross-chaining over, or, or I should say cross-certifying to any kind of public trusted route, the key word is, the nice thing is it kind of goes back to the black and white model, public and private trust. As long as you're in the private trusted side, you can kind of do whatever you want, so to speak, right? You don't really have to follow the CAPF requirements at that point. Um, does it help to be kind of some main, some kind of happy medium in there? Yes, yeah, just because it makes it easier for you to upgrade your, uh, do cryptographic upgrades over the years. But, but absolutely not. If you're doing private trust or private um, PKI initiative internally, you don't have to be keep, um, um, CAPF compliant. Even with our private SSL solution that we offer through Manage PKI for SSL, um, even with the automation functions that we're bringing out um, in the next in the next few weeks, we're still you don't have to be. CAPF compliant because it's using a private route. And again, private routes can be from the public CA. We have Semantic as private. We've had a private infrastructure for a really long time, and we have customers that use it. They still don't have to be CAPF compliant. Or we can let off their existing route, let's say. So again, kind of a long-winded response, but that hopefully that answers the question. Kind of jump down to a couple more here. Um, so I see some couple of questions there about customers not being able to see the slides. Um, I get a I get a Excel spreadsheet when this is done. Uh, what I do is I try to go back through every question that's not answered, and I try to provide um, the presentation for those who don't see it. So I will you will get a copy in PDF if you want to see it as well. And again, you can always contact your account manager. Hey, I didn't see the slides. Give me the PDF version, and I'll send it out. Not an issue. Okay. And again, um, let me see. Let's look down here. So the question here is, is, is the CIC a separate offering we want to use to manage internally issued and semantic search, or is it included since we are semantic customers? Um, that's kind of a loaded question, so I'll give you kind of the loaded answer there. So I'll give you the yes and no's. <laughs> we have what's called enterprise suite, where you can order your SSL certs. So you can purchase SSL, and you can purchase some other solutions with kind of an, what we call an enterprise scalable bundle, um, where you can have CIC, private CA. We even have secure application service, kind of a different interface. But again, kind of different things, again, based on the customer's larger need. Um, and that makes for good enterprise scalability. So that's kind of the yes on, that, on, on having multiple solutions in there. But normally, CIC is only sold as a, and a, and a kind of a tack on service, I guess, um, to manage PKI for SSL customers because that's our most heavily vested customer. So in the, in the beginning or at the genesis of the solution, you could you had to buy them separate and because one had a subscription service, one you're just buying units. Um, but today, you can work with your account manager and they can work with you on kind of bundling options. And I hope that helps you out there with that. But with the um, kind of as an additional tidbit, with the automation of certificates, there are licenses you purchase for automation, but it's one license per automation model, right? So if I have a, so let's take a dev server as an example, and I deposit, you know, an agent there, it's an IIS box, and I got 40, 30 or 40 certificates residing there in that dev environment, I can manage, I can pick and choose what I want to manage, or I can manage all of them um, with that one agent, and it's only considered one license. So there's, it's a, again, kind of looking at the longer term of the, of the best bang for the buck on that, okay? And that will also be applied to private SSL, uh, like I said, within the next few weeks. So hopefully that answers the question for you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, quick question here, and I'm going to give back to John because we're getting ready to run now. I think we're actually getting ready. I, maybe I'll do this as the last question, if that's okay, John, um, is uh, someone that asked about mobile apps. Um, and again, you know, mobile apps, that's kind of a general question, but well, if, if you're talking about with the use of SHA-1 and SHA-2, I think Leland put a nice answer out there about SSL Detective. That's one way you can do it. Um, but again, never hurts to contact a vendor, especially if you have... Um, Enterprise contracts absolutely should be using it. Um, we also use things like TSA that we can also contact vendors as well. So we can open cases up through, to the vendors for the customers as well. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, but 
mobile applications in general when they play in this model. Um, yeah, SHA-1, SHA-2 is going to definitely affect it. Um, key sizes are going to affect it. Chaining certificates are going to affect it. So if you're using older handsets, you definitely want to be in contact with vendors because, um, unfortunately, some handsets can stay out there for a very long time, especially in BYOD environments that you're bringing in there. And, and again, this that goes back to that earlier slide about all the things you have to manage as an enterprise administrator. If you're allowing BYOD, are you, are you allowing roots to be pushed from your private environment to those nodes as well? And are, do you have legal disclaimers that are covering you for that? Again, always the physical and logical aspects of things from, from a policy perspective. Okay? And again, kind of spitballing on that, but just kind of hopefully I'm giving you more than less here. So I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, we're one past the hour, which we were kind of over at this point. So. At this point, I think that's the last of our questions, of course. Any other questions, I'll, I'll, I will answer independently um, through a spreadsheet. And if it's something for A10, John will definitely be consulted as well, and we can provide answers. But that brings us to the end of today's web seminar. On behalf of A10 and the rest of Semantic Trust Services team, we want to thank you for your attendance, and we look forward to your continued business. And thank you for your participation, and have a great day.